estás viendo. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Keith Rossig. I'm a colonel in the United States Air Force, and I'm currently the vice commander for the Air Force Test Center. Uh, the Air Force Test Center is, uh, comprises 18,000 people at about 34 locations across the country. Um, three test wings uh, underneath the test center. Uh, one of those is the 412th test wing here at uh, Edwards Air Force Base, uh, who is co-hosting the uh, air show this week. And so the mission of the, of the test center is to uh, develop and test and evaluate uh, systems for, uh, to, develop, or to deliver warfighter capability uh, and for the Air Force. And so uh, I'll show a video in, in a couple seconds about what, what that entails. But what I do want to, to ask you a question right now is why do we need a test center? Uh, why do we need something to, to go through and evaluate some of these systems that we uh, uh, purchase? So um, we'll talk about it in a second, but I just want you to think about that in a little bit, and then and we'll talk about it more afterwards. So if you could roll the uh, first video, it's a mission video about Air Force Test Center and shows you a lot of examples of things we do uh, every day in, uh, across the, the, the nation. So hopefully uh, it gives you a little taste of things that go on in the, in the test center. Um, what you saw in the video uh, was a number of different things. Obviously, we start with uh, some ground test facilities so we can test engines or um, aircraft models inside wind tunnels. Uh, we can replicate uh, environmental conditions. You saw some icing where you had F-35s and, and other fighter aircraft uh, undergoing icing conditions in a facility we have in, in Florida. Uh, there's a number of things we do on the ground uh, leading up to uh, flight test, and then obviously we saw uh, uh, lots of, of aircraft flying as well. And so the reason I talked about why we need an Air Force test center is uh, what we in, in, within test we predict, test, and validate. And and the point is that we have computer models, right? That's one of the big uh, big initiatives right now. How can we digitally model all these things? Well, all models are wrong. Some are useful. 
And so the point is that, it, uh, that we can model, we can predict what we think behavior uh, of a system is going to be. And then we have to go actually do the test and see if it matches, right? If our predictions are good, uh, then we can do a lot less test and we can uh, send uh, warfighter capability out sooner. Um, oftentimes we do a prediction and that's not what happens. And we have to go back and really understand the system performance. So that's where the engineering uh, really plays into it, understanding what the systems, what we intended them to do uh, and, and what they are actually doing uh, to go back and, and make sure that the systems performed as, as, uh, as designed or at least understand why they aren't performing as we did and, and, and giving information to the decision makers that if it's, not, if it's performing differently, can, do we need to fix it? How much is it going to cost? How long is it going to take to fix it? And those trade-offs. So, uh, so while we do a lot of modeling and a lot of prediction, uh, you still have to go out there and fly the aircraft, drop the weapon, um, whatever that is, to make sure the system works. And so that's across the test center how, how I got here. Um, I started um, at the University of California, Davis, uh, where I did my undergraduate work. I did some uh, graduate school at the uh, University of Notre Dame. Um, before coming on active duty. Um, and since then, I did a couple of uh, research lab tours uh, to start off with, uh, then went to the Air Force Test Pilot School as an engineer. So at, at Test Pilot School, half the class uh, roughly is, uh, is uh, pilots or system operators, and then the other half are engineers. And so uh, after test pilot school, uh, did uh, a number of test tours, uh, looked at some defensive systems, um, looked at uh, F-35 flight test, as well as, uh, and then the sled track, and we'll talk about the high-speed test track here in a few minutes. A um, couple other assignments also went to Arnold Air Force Base, where we do a lot of the wind tunnels and ground test facilities to try to replicate um, the atmosphere, whether that's from sea level all the way up to 100,000 feet. Uh, and different uh, flying conditions to try to test these things so we understand them before they fly. Um, and then uh, now here at uh, Edwards for, for the, my third assignment here at Edwards. Um, and that's kind of a little bit of a track uh, of how I got here. Um, so I know we may have questions later about uh, how I got, you know, what my thoughts were uh, as I go through that career. Um, but what I do want to touch on and, and get to another video is uh, we, I talk about the high speed test track and one of the ways which we replicate um, uh, the flight environment is to go ahead and, and use rockets to propel systems to whatever speed we need. Uh, you, saw, you saw in the video that there were, were some ejection seats uh, from a, a rocket sled on the ground, right? So we can uh, simulate different, uh, uh, different conditions, flight conditions, under which we have the ejection seats go and, and and measure what the forces are on, on people. Uh, so uh, Dr. Uh, John Stapp, uh, Colonel Stapp, uh, back in the 50s, um, when we were first starting to understand, uh, look at ejection seats, understand uh, human restraints, um, and I understand the, the class that you're gonna be looking at is gonna be uh, later in the hour, is a uh, how do you do a shock absorbing system for, for possibly a moon landing. And so Dr. John Stapp, back in the 50s, uh, put himself on a rocket sled that was decelerated uh, at about 30 G's, I think is the number, uh, to prove that humans can actually withstand uh, such a load. And so we'll, we'll get to a, a video in a second in which um, uh, that shows a, a replication of, the, of what he went through. Uh, obviously, there's no people on that. And that's one thing I want to look, I want you to, uh, to think about why we don't do uh, human testing on a rocket sled uh, as a little bit of a, of, a, of a preview. So when he did his, his worst case deceleration, right, so he put enough uh, stress on himself that he burst some blood vessels in his eyes and was temporarily blind. So um, obviously, there's a risk factor there. But there's other reasons why we don't need to have humans uh, in, that, uh, in that condition anymore. Um, so let's go ahead and roll the video and it shows what you'll see is there's uh, some rockets uh, pro pro propelling the uh, sled forward and a deceleration process that I want to talk about uh, afterwards. So please roll the video. Four, three, two, one, zero, fire. Three, 
Gabriel, fire. Three, two, one, zero, fire. Okay, so uh, so the video, obviously, we had uh, rockets accelerating, uh, the rockets finished burning, you saw some travel, and then it hit water. And so the braking system is actually water, uh, and uh, there's two ways they start. They put little water bags along the rails uh, to start uh, deceleration, and then they have this, uh, this system of, of sequential dams where they actually raise that water level, starts really low, and then you have higher and higher levels of water so that's what you're seeing coming out from that sled is just water. And that's how, what they use to actually create the deceleration uh, that uh, was able to. Sh and so Dr. Stapp was able to show that, that humans could use basically seatbelts, right? That seatbelts were a, a viable method to, to protect uh, humans during uh, this, these kinds of decelerations or accelerations, whether that be for cars, whether it be for uh, astronauts um, and all those things. So why? So why don't we do uh, human testing anymore? One, I did mention that hey, the risk involved of putting a person in there, uh, especially as you go to more and more violent uh, kinds of decelerations, uh, it's just very risky to do just from a safety perspective. Um, but you did see a mannequin in the, uh, in the sled there. And so right now, whenever we do ejection seat testing or those that sled deceleration, we actually have instrumentation that we can now put on and measure what the forces are and then try to try to correlate that with uh, uh, the kinds of injuries that would be sustained by a human so and what i mean by correlate is that we know that here's the forces here's what we the models i talked about here's what we think will happen to a person if they have those forces uh, placed on them and then uh, try to predict what those injuries would be and make sure that the injuries are definitely survivable. Um, and so uh, the big one for that right now is always ejection seats. When you've got people of different sizes and shapes, they all uh, will behave slightly differently in an ejection seat. So, um, so it's the modeling and the instrumentation. So back in John Stapp's day, we still use some very bulky electronics. And nowadays, uh, you've got your iPhones, right? So that, those, that level of electronics, that development now allows us to get that same information without having to put people at risk uh, by doing the testing. So, so that technology development helps us do testing of, of more things. So, um, so very different, uh, um, different environment that now than what we had uh, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Um, so uh, so you, that was just kind of an example of a different braking system, a different way to go about doing it as you start thinking about uh, your, um, your uh, shock absorbing uh, system uh, for the, the task uh, coming up. Um, and then uh, I guess a couple bits of advice uh, before we go to questions. So everybody talks about well, what do you need to do? Uh, obviously, when people think STEM, right? So the science, technology, engineering, mathematics, those are the things you definitely need to study. Um, I would uh, add uh, communications to that. Um, it's very easy going through high school and even to college that, hey, I want to uh, take those difficult courses and I want to really learn the math and the engineering and things that, uh, that not everybody gets to, that can do. Um, but the communication is, is vital. If you have a great idea, a great plan, a great design, but you can't communicate your ideas to anybody else, it's not going to be helpful. So whether it be written or oral communication, it, uh, that is a skill set that uh, you definitely need to, to bring along with the engineering side of it as you move forward, whether that be high school or college or beyond. So um, 
a bit of advice. It's one of those things where looking back, I should have done uh, things earlier with that and didn't, and, and, and that learning process will have to happen regardless. So um, just something to be aware of more earlier on. But, uh, but that's all I have about myself. Um, I think uh, we can go over to uh, questions uh, now, uh, either texting in or I know there's some prepared ones as well. So over to you, awesome. Kayla. Awesome. Thank you. Let's see. The first question, what led you to pursue your career and why did you study what you did in college and for your master's degree okay. as well? So uh, I've always been interested in the engineering. So math and science, it's just uh, something that from early on, that was what I was more interested mm -hmm. in. Um, so it just, it kind of grew out of that, uh, as far as choosing the air force, um, uh, to be honest, I've, so my father was, was Navy. Uh, so there's a little bit of the military background. Um, scholarships were always a big thing too, right. Of, of being able to, uh, to get some money to pay for, for, uh, college. Um, I will say that, uh, uh, a lot of folks think they need a plan of what they're going to do throughout their career and their life. And, uh, um, there are there's always opportunities that come up throughout your career that you never know existed so uh so don't feel like you have to have a great plan uh now or when you leave high school or even leaving college because there's going to be things you learn about as you go through life that will be opportunities so so don't feel like you need to have a perfect plan to get started uh there's there, there's no reason your plans will change regardless so um just understand uh, what those opportunities are so you can take advantage of them when they come up. Okay, perfect. So here's a question that we ask a lot of the speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your favorite aircraft? Favorite aircraft? <laughs> um, I guess I'll have to say F-35 right now. So I spent, uh, so I got here for my second assignment at, at Edwards. Um, I got uh, here uh, about six months before the first test aircraft arrived at Edwards. Um, and so uh, I spent a lot of hours uh, here on base uh, doing the testing. So it was just something that uh, um, is a, a, a challenging time and the things that we were asked to do and the amount of work we were trying to be asked to do in, in a short time. Um, so proud of the fact that we got the, the aircraft going and, and from when I started where you could fly at a very limited speed and an altitude range, you couldn't go very fast or very far or very high. Um, and then by the time we left, uh, it was a very capable aircraft. So, uh, so happy with that. So I would say more of that's my favorite from that experience. But uh, as an engineer, I was not a pilot in, in any in any way, so uh, so it's not like I, I flew any of these myself. So. Perfect. Let's see, another question. Um, out of all the different bases you mm -hmm. have been stationed at, which one, or what are some of the experience you have learned throughout the different? So move a lot, right? <laughs> uh, I've averaged about two years. So move about every two years on average, right? So I've had some longer assignments and some schools that were shorter. Uh, it's always the people that make uh, the difference of where, wherever I've been stationed. So uh, I've had, like I said, three assignments here. Uh, the deserts of New Mexico, where if you think you're a little remote at Edwards, uh, try remote New Mexico. That's even, even farther out. Um, but then, obviously, Eastern Seaboard uh, up at Hanscom Air Force Base or in the uh, National Capital Region uh, or Eglin. So there's pros and cons to every location uh, in, the, in the country. But there's always great people everywhere, and, and so uh, that's really been the, the make or break for us is, is the, the people that we are stationed with and the friends we make. So that's always, always a, a good, a good uh, way to think about it. So. Perfect. So at Edwards, we have a innovation challenge, and mm -hmm. you could hear it. It's a buzzword around here. So what does innovation mean to you, and why is it important? So obviously, uh, innovation is important just in terms of uh, thinking about the next big thing, and that can be anything. We're, we're obviously, we're focused here on military capability, but that can be uh, anywhere. Um, and so, uh, innovation to me is is generally, um, I would say, just you, you're pushing the boundaries for for that next thing. And there's a couple ways to go about it. There can be we're improving on something known over and over to make that as uh, the best it can be, whether, whatever that means, the, the best in, the, in that case. And other times it's pulling together multiple, uh, multiple ideas and that are from different areas. And how do we apply an idea in one area to another one? And that's, uh, that's a little more difficult to do. 
Um, and when we talk about engineers learning the mathematics and the engineering and the sciences, um, and I talked about communication, um, I, the innovation tends to be when you bring ideas or people together from different uh, backgrounds. So you may have arts, you may have um, architects, you may have other other fields coming together and and when you combine those separate ideas that's when you I think you can really get some powerful uh, innovation the new ideas new applications um, and so but it's tough right everybody says it's the buzzword like you said go innovate and and that's not something you can say well I'm gonna go innovate for the next hour and at the end I'm gonna have this great idea right so um, we like to say that we're gonna set something up and we're going to go do that. It's more of an environment. How do you create an environment in which you can uh, try? And you're going to fail a lot. When you, when you innovate, you will try 100 things before you get to, uh, uh, get to the idea that works. And I think the, the quote that's used a lot in support of that is Thomas Edison uh, was asked a question that, hey, you've, you failed you know, 100 times or 200 times to, to make this light bulb work. Um, and he says, well, I didn't fail. I found 200 ways not to do, make a light bulb, right? And, and eventually you get that one. So um, having that environment, not only to bring those ideas together, but then also to be able to fail, which is learning, right? Are you learning without being, uh, being I would say, uh, considered a failure? So that's, a, that's always an important aspect to an innovation uh, environment, I think. So along the lines of failure and adversity, what kind of challenges did you face while accomplishing to reach your goal and how did you overcome them? Uh, so overcoming it, right? The, the, uh, the stigma of failure, it, it just sounds like, oh, you failed, right? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, uh, like you said, it, maybe you, you, you found a way that you couldn't succeed. That doesn't mean um, uh, that, uh, that it wasn't useful, right? Mm -hmm. that because the test didn't happen how you thought it was, you learned something. So if you learn something, it's not a failure. So uh, I think that's a tough one to get around. Um, growing up, when you go through school, right, there is a right answer. And here is, and I have this score on a test. It's very cut and dry. Um, getting into the real world, there may not be right answers, right? There are multiple ways to go about doing something and understanding that, hey, if I try this way and it doesn't work, I try another way it doesn't work, that's not failure, that's, that's learning. So that's hard to overcome though. And so uh, I was uh, um, lucky enough, uh, my first assignment in the research lab, I was able to go do a lot of hands-on experimentation. Um, and so I think that was one of the, uh, the first times where you, you're, gonna, you're gonna try things and it's not gonna work. Um, that's not a failure. That just means you've learned, learned a way that it doesn't work. So apply that and what you learned and, and, and uh, adjust and, and do it again, so. Okay, so on to the next question. Here's a good question. Mm -hmm. Do engineers ever get to fly airplanes? Uh, yes. Um, so uh, there are multiple flying uh, billets uh, as engineers. Um, obviously, if it, it's going to be a multi-seat aircraft, if it's a fighter, it'll be two seats, um, and you're in the back, and so the pilot is in the front, uh, especially doing takeoffs and landings and the close formations. However, when you're up and away and, and doing other things, uh, there's definitely time where engineers are allowed to fly, um, as well as uh, going through test pilot school you need the engineers that are often in the control room supporting uh, the flight test, they need to understand what the pilots are doing, what they're going through. And so uh, there, there's a lot of opportunity to, to understand why an aircraft behaves the way it does based on its design, right? So an F-16, a small fighter aircraft, does not look or behave at all like a, a big cargo aircraft which doesn't look or behave like a passenger aircraft that you would fly, right? There's, there's reasons for those differences, and that produces different uh, flight uh, characteristics. So, so yes, we do. As much as there's a lot of engineering, a lot of math, um, and a lot of hard work that goes into it, you, you look at that mission video, and there's a lot of cool stuff going on, right? You get to fly, you get to blow things up. <laughs> and so uh, there's always a little bit that, that's, uh, that's fun to do, uh, even though the work of leading up to those things can be tough. So. Perfect. So next question. So we have students mainly in middle school right now watching mm -hmm. this. Uh, what advice would you give to students who would like to pursue a career in aviation or engineering, whether it be middle school, and what can they do throughout middle school up until high school to prepare for that? 
Um, so, uh, okay, so, you know, there's always the basics, right? To uh, um, learn, uh, you study the math, you study the engineering and the sciences and the physics, and that gets you that, that technical background. Um, but there's no reason, I'll say there's, then there's a practical aspect. If you are interested in aviation, there are many, many ways to, uh, to be involved in, in the aircraft flying, and, and it's one of those where because you understand the equations and the math and why an aircraft flies, it's very different than being able to go and fly the aircraft. And so if you're interested in, in aviation or engineering, there's, there's plenty of ways to get involved of, of learning about that, whether it be you know, museums, whether it be uh, um, uh, online videos, other things there's to learn about the aircraft itself. And, and don't, uh, don't discount... Um, just physical ability. Uh, so obviously there are physicals that to go be a flyer, uh, you have to be in good enough shape that, uh, that you can un with undergo the stresses, obviously not like we saw on the sled track, but even for general aviation, they wanna make sure that you're healthy to do that. So, so never neglect uh, uh, the other uh, aspects of school, whether it be PE or, or those kinds of things. So. Uh, being a well-rounded individual will help you in whatever you want to do, regardless of that's within a STEM uh, application or not. So, um, so be open to learning anything. Um, obviously, you have a lot of time in front of you, so don't feel it's ever too late as well. So let's say you decide to change something in midway through high school, you want it, you decide, or even into college, never too late to start. So a um, bit of a generic answer, but uh, that's probably all I've got for right now. Perfect. And it looks like we have time for one last question. And so it is, what does it feel like to experience G-forces? <laughs> so, uh, so good one, right? Um, so uh, you, if it's heavy, right? So if you're undergoing three Gs, that means you know, you're three times the weight of, uh, of of what you'd normally have. So even just lifting your arm, right? So it's, if your arm if, is 20 pounds, you know, it's now 60 pounds or, or that, so that's what you're, what you're doing, which uh, normally you're in a seat, so you don't have to move a whole lot, but there are times uh, that uh, uh, you just, it feels real heavy. Um, you will see fighter pilots that have, uh, um, that over years, right? So especially when they're trying to turn their head and you have G's going, it really puts a lot of strain on your neck. So uh, you will see sometimes they either have muscles in their neck, uh, um, but it's really hard to turn your head and it's really disorienting. So that's a tough one. At even higher G's, so three to four, I think G's most people handle that without much of a problem. Um, but then yes, at higher G's, when you start thinking about blackout, well, just there's so much pressure down. Interesting, um, without a doubt, when you go through uh, for fighter aircraft, you go through a centrifuge and they will take you up to nine G's and, uh, and it's, uh, it, it's brutal. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not fun, but uh, it's something that especially uh, certain uh, career fields need to be able to do. As an engineer, they just wanna make sure we're aware of uh, what that feels like and how to combat it. There are different uh, maneuvers, a G-straining maneuver they call it. There's different ways to combat uh, the G-forces that you will undergo if uh, you are flying in a fighter aircraft. Um, but. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a different feeling for sure, so. Perfect, well, it looks like that is all the time we have for questions and answers. Thank you again for speaking to the students and giving them an insight to what you do. And now we'll hand it off to the NASA educators for our next lesson. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us um, at the Aerospace Valley Air Show. Um, we'd like to take this time to thank Edwards Air Force Base 412th Test Wing um, for this amazing opportunity to be able to live stream and connect with you. Um, I am uh, Sara Torres. I'm part of the NASA EPDC um, Educator Professional um, Collaborative uh, Group. Um, I actually am working at Ames Research Center. That's me on the right-hand side. And my colleague on the left, Monica Oribe, um, she's also the education specialist for um, 
Edwards our first space. And so the, we'll, you'll see us there. There's there's about there's 10 um, NASA centers across the, the um, United States. Uh, you may be more familiar with um, Kennedy, where they do a lot of the launches, um, or Johnson Space Center, where we do a lot of the training for the astronauts. Um, but uh, we do a lot of important work at ARC and AFRC as well. We have a lot of the flight um, tests and, and everything that's going on there. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we're involved with Artemis program and, and others. Um, but we're also part of the um, NASA OSTEM team. And OSEM is Office of STEM Engagement. So for some of you out there who are educators or guardians, um, be sure and check out our website at the end of this um, presentation and get more information about how we can um, uh, help out in your classrooms. So today we're going to explore um, the engineering design process. Uh, if some of you may be joining us um, uh, from yesterday, we talked a little bit about yesterday and we'll talk a little bit more about it today and look and break it down as to how it works within the um, activity that we've chosen for today. Uh, we're also going to talk about Artemis moon landers. Yesterday we talked about the Artemis mission. We'll do a little review of that and then we'll also um, uh, talk about the moon landers and we're gonna have our NASA hands-on activity. So um, we had, uh, on Monday, we talked about small steps of giant leaps, which is all about flight. And it's uh, reducing the loud, um, the sonic boom to a thump. And then um, today we're gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, commercial crew and how that, that that also aligns with, um, uh, with today's activity. So commercial crew program, and also of course, Artemis. So today's activity um, is touchdown. So it's a little bit of, of um, as I said, commercial crew um, and really more um, Artemis because it's, it's we're returning to the moon. You may notice that there are some uh, materials list here and you may have those materials in front of you or you may have materials that um, may be a substitute and that's totally okay. So um, the main thing uh, on today's um, um, activity is we're really gonna talk about a shock absorbing system and how that work and why that's so important um, in our spacecraft. So, um, so uh, just like we have a shock absorbing a system in our own bodies. And if you stop and think about that, you know, when you jump up, uh, you don't jump up with your legs straight out like this, right? What happens? In order to jump, you have to bend your knees, right? So you bend your knees, you jump up, and when you land, your knees are having to also bend a little bit to, to absorb that shock. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that um, in our spacecraft. So um, of course, uh, Artemis, as you may, if you, if you joined us yesterday, you saw a video about why it's called Artemis. Um, in the 60s and 1960s, we of course had missions that were called Apollo missions and we were, we were traveling to the moon. Um, and so what a lot of people didn't know or don't know or don't stop to think about is that Artemis had a twin sister and her name is Artemis. She's a goddess of the moon. So the big, um, the big, um, I guess the most exciting thing is that we're going to have the first woman land on, on the moon when we return. So let's watch this video on, we go to the moon. I don't know that we actually have the video. Hopefully some of you that are joining us today, joined us yesterday and saw that. But um, for some reason, I'm, I can't get the video, but that's okay, we'll keep going. Um, so let's look at um, the different phases of Artemis. So we have three phases of Artemis and we'll see how, um, one of the things that I like about this diagram is we're talking about, um, uh, about um, the different phases is that the first phase is really getting that first human um, uh, spacecraft uh, to the moon in, in the 21st century. And then um, Artemis II will be the first humans to orbit the moon and rendezvous in deep space. And then um, uh, three, phase three 
is actually um, where Orion and the crew will dock to um, human uh, uh, landing uh, systems for a uh, crew expedition to the surface. That's what we're going to be talking about uh, today when we talk about um, uh, a gateway. And, uh, and so if you look in the center of the, um, the picture on your screen right now, you'll see the, the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover. Uh, we, better, we know it better as Viper. So that's going to be um, the rover that will be collecting um, a lot of the data as to um, uh, materials and substances on the, on the moon. So of course, in order to, to be able to get there and to do all of the work, we will be um, expanding our technology. Um, and you see here that there is a quite a bit of a, uh, technology that will be um, that's in the process of being uh, uh, created. Uh, then NASA is not doing it alone. They're doing it with several uh, commercial partners as well. Um, in order for all of this to come together, of course, yesterday we talked in, again, this is just a review. So in case we have any new viewers, um, we will get there with the, with the space launch system uh, or the SLS. Um, that's the only rocket with the power and capability required to carry astronauts to deep space um, on board the Orion spacecraft. And at the top, at the very tip, you'll see where Orion sits. Um, and that's the only spacecraft capable of carrying and sustaining crew uh, crew on missions into deep space and providing um, an emergency abort capability. And we talked about that um, yesterday as well. And safe reentry re -entry from lunar um, return velocities. And of course, we have the ground systems and then gateway. So a lot of phase two um, will actually give us the opportunity to build the gateway. And um, let's see if we can get to Gateway, it's a closer image of Gateway. So Gateway is um, actually, will be orbiting around the moon, similar to the way the ISS is orbiting around Earth. Uh, the great thing about um, Gateway is that's where the astronauts will actually um, live and they will, um, they will go to the moon, travel to the moon from there. And, um, and then they'll return back to Gateway after they finish their work. So that's why it's so important to really come up with a good um, uh, launch or um, landing system so that we can make sure that, that everybody's getting there safely. So we're gonna watch um, a video called Seven Minutes of Terror, hopefully, if, it, if I have it in the, in the PowerPoint. <laughs> When people look at it, uh, it looks crazy. That's a very natural thing. Sometimes when we look at it, it looks crazy. It is the result of reasoned engineering thought. It still looks crazy. From the top of the atmosphere, down to the surface, it takes us seven minutes. It takes 14 minutes or so for the signal from the spacecraft to make it to Earth. That's how far Mars is away from us. So when we first get word that we've touched the top of the atmosphere, the vehicle has been alive and dead on the surface for at least seven minutes. Entry descent and landing, also known as EDL, is referred to as a seven minutes of terror because we've got literally seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of Mars, going from 13,000 miles an hour to zero in perfect sequence, perfect choreography, perfect timing. And the computer has to do it all by itself with no help from there. It, if any one thing doesn't work just right, it's game over. Slam into the atmosphere, develops so much aerodynamic drag. Our heat shield, it heats up and it glows like the surface of the sun. 1600 degrees. During entry, the vehicles not only slowing down violently through the atmosphere, but also we are guiding it like an airplane to be able to land in a very narrow, constrained space. 
this is one of the biggest challenges that we're facing and one that we have never attempted on Mars. Mars is actually really hard to slow down because it has just enough atmosphere that you have to deal with. Otherwise, it will destroy your spacecraft. On the other hand, it doesn't have enough atmosphere to finish the job. We're still going about a thousand miles an hour. So at that point, we use a parachute. The parachute is the largest and strongest supersonic parachute that we've ever built to date. It has to be able to withstand 65,000 pounds of force, even though the parachute itself only weighs about 100 pounds. up that fast it's a neck snapping nine genes at that point we have to get that heat shield off it's like a big lens cap blocking our view of the ground to the radar the radar has to take just the right altitude and velocity measurements at just the right time or the rest of the landing sequence won't work this big huge parachute that we've got mm -hmm. will only slow us down to about 200 miles an hour and that's not slow enough to land so we have no choice, but we got to cut it off and come down in rockets. Once we turn those rocket motors on, if we don't do something, we're just going to smack right back into the parachute. So the first thing we do is make this really radical diverting maneuver. We fly off to the side, diverting away from the parachute, killing our horizontal velocity and our vertical velocity, getting the rover moving straight up and down so it can look at the surface with its radar and see where we're going to land and we head straight down to the bottom of the crater right beside six kilometer high mountain. You can't get those rocket engines too close to the ground because if we were to descend propulsively with our engines all the way to the ground, we would essentially create this massive dust cloud. That dust cloud could then go and land on the rover. It could damage mechanisms and it could damage instruments. So the way we solve that problem is by using the sky crane. 20 meters above the surface, we have to lower the rover below us on a tether, 21 feet long, and then gently deposit it on its wings on the surface. As the rover touches down and is now on the ground, in the same stage, it's in a collision force with the rover. You must cut the bridle immediately and fly to the same stage to a safe distance from the rover. So as you saw, that was pretty cool uh, video. And now that that lunar uh, or that lander was actually on its way to to Mars. So we hear about what happens on Mars. And as you know, we've had about 40 or actually about four rovers that have landed on Mars and we're wait, waiting on Perseverance to get there as well. Um, but the reason why we showed that is because it's a very similar um, process as to what happens when we're landing things on on the moon or these rovers on the moon. So um, so if you look at this question, what dangers would astronauts face if they landed here? And you look at the, the, um, the close up there, you see how um, it's kind of focused in on there. Well, the first people who, who landed on the moon took a big risk because um, the moon is covered with a thick layer of fine dust and no one knew how, how deep or how soft this layer was. So, um, you know, would a, would a spacecraft sink out of sight when it landed? Um, well, now we know. So all of those questions were answered after the Apollo um, missions. And, um, and we know that the layer is firm. So in the picture, you know, you can see Apollo 11's lander pads, um, you know, and, and this is an animation or a little cartoon, of course, but it sank only about two, about two inches or five centimeters to the dust. And so it was a big relief. And um, this helped NASA figure out uh, the kinds of shock absorbers and landing systems that, um, that is needed for a spacecraft. So this is the first, the first uh, lunar lander uh, research vehicle. Um, of course, I'd already mentioned the Apollo missions a couple of times, but this is a vehicle that was used. And you may look at this photo, uh, this photograph. It's a photograph, and say, "Wait a minute, that's not the moon. Uh, that's here on Earth." And that's right. You know, before anything could happen or or could be taken or landed on the moon, it was tested uh, here on Earth, and it was tested at the Neil Armstrong Flight Research Center. 
Um, but this, this lunar lander was built of a tubular aluminum alloy. It was like a giant four-legged uh, bedstead. So the vehicle was uh, to simulate a lunar landing uh, profile from around 1500 feet to the moon's surface. So when Apollo um, planning was underway in, in 1960, uh, NASA was looking for um, a simulator, uh, simulator to uh, profile the descent to the moon's surface. So this, um, the LLRV or Lunar Lander Research Vehicle um, were relied on for the simulation and training of moon landings. Um, so this small leap in research really allowed the United States advanced in technology providing the the stepping stone to the first lunar landing on on the moon. So which takes me to current times. So all along we're learning, we're researching and we're learning from past um, missions and past tests. And um, NASA now needs a spacecraft that can land gently uh, for getting astronauts to and from the moon safely, just like I talked about how our bodies have a natural um, shock absorbing system in it naturally. Um, so NASA is, um, you know, looking for this and, and once they find one, uh, they need to design and build a spacecraft that can land there uh, without injuring astronauts or damaging the, um, the spacecraft. So they've narrowed the search to three different designs. On the left, um, SpaceX has this uh, space propellant, they call it, and then on the right, uh, the company Dianetics um, has its unique low like slug crew model, uh, putting the crew very close to the lunar surface for transfer and access. This one is actually um, uh, an award-winning design. Um, there was a team um, that uh, got together and designed this one, and um, and so these are you know it's an architecture that um, that also um, uses a, that ascent, descent, and transfer elements. So um, so with all of these people working uh, towards creating a, a, a new design, NASA is confident that our, our nation's ability to perform in in this uh, Artemis uh, mission or program. So um, the landing is set for 2024. Um, it's considered the most dangerous and complex flying task attempted by humans in more than 50 years. And it's only been done six times like ever. So that's why NASA's astronauts are so excited to learn how to fly these landers so they can make a smooth touchdown on the lunar surface and to do uh, what we do, which is to explore. So now it's our turn to explore. Um, as I said earlier, um, you may have these uh, materials in front of you, uh, or you may have similar materials to these. Um, but basically, your challenge is going to be to design and build a shock absorbing system that will protect two astronauts when they land. Now, if you have the materials in front of you that, that are listed here on this page, you'll have a couple, uh, two marshmallows uh, that are pretty, you know, the larger size. If you don't have those and you have something else to substitute um, the astronauts, that's okay. But um, the biggest uh, thing to remember is that um, uh, one of the constraints is to make sure that your cabin or your paper cup, that's the only, um, uh, constraint that we have is that the cup needs to stay open. So no designing lids um, to cover that space. Um, it's a little bit different than, um, than of course, uh, the, the lunar landers that are being uh, designed now for, um, for our astronauts. But in this case, the, the, the whole point is to try to really um, uh, work on your shock absorbing system. And so what's going to happen when you get that shock absorbing system working well? Are your astronauts going to pop out of your cup? I'll give you a minute. You're right. They're not. If you if if you create the um, shock absorbing system well, your astronauts are going to stay in your cup. So we're going to follow the uh, the engineering design process. And this is something that um, Colonel uh, Razig really um, uh, touched on his presentation that what really kind of stood out as he was talking excitedly about his career is that, you know, you can't think about times that you think of being failure. Um, or it's not really a failure. It's just you just found a way or or um, you figured out a, a way that doesn't quite work. 
so you know how to adjust it. Well, that's exactly what the engineering design process is, is encouraging you to do. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna ask questions. Um, so in this case, we ask questions like, okay, are there any constraints? Well, the constraints is that you can't have a top to your a cabin uh, where your astronauts will ride or will, will travel. The next uh, quest or the next step is to imagine. So you're gonna brainstorm solutions, you're gonna research ideas, um, and then you're going to you're going to start planning. And so when you plan, you want to draw a diagram. The reason why you want to draw a draw a diagram is so that later on, as you be begin to um, to test, you can always make notes as to what works and what doesn't work. Then you're going to create, you're going to test, you're going to improve and share. So here's here's our materials. Like I said earlier, you may have these, you may not, and that's okay. You may have other materials that are that may be substituted. In this photograph, you can see that the marshmallows have been substituted to these little dolls, and that's okay. So what um, so what shock absorbing uh, absorber system can you make from these materials? And so um, and so uh, as I said, if you need to uh, uh, substitute some materials, that's okay. Uh, here's a design plan, and then you can start to create. There's a testing. You're going to test it from a height of one meter, and then you're going to take notes, and then you're going to improve your design, and you're going to share it. So here's a quick video of one test, and of course, you'll take notes on what you saw. So these are some uh, discussion, discussion questions that you can ask. So what forces affected your lander as it fell? Um, how does testing help engineers improve a design? And what are the benefits, the property and constraints of, of building materials? Um, what did um, you use to increase the shock absorption? And so these are all things that you can ask yourself after you've created your um, actual uh, design and test it out. So here's some additional resources for those of you who are educators. Um, be sure and check us out at www.txstate-epdc.net. You'll find great resources there uh, to implement into your classroom. Um, uh, there's also the nasa.gov. Um, Aero Research, these have great um, new lessons that you can also implement, um, especially on, um, uh, on a flight. And then there's, the, of course, a NASA.gov, NASA at Home for Kids and Families, which also has many great resources uh, for, your, for students to try it at home. And then you can also sign up at the NASA.gov STEM Express. That also links you to additional resources, uh, such as webinars for educators and even additional um, uh, opportunities for students. So um, um, thank you very much um, for, um, for joining us today. I have one more uh, video. Um, we are going to the moon. Hopefully, uh, we'll have enough time to watch this last video. <sighs> Between 1968 and 1972, America launched nine human missions to the moon, six of which successfully touched down, allowing 12 men to walk on the lunar surface. NASA's next chapter of lunar exploration, called Artemis, has the task of not just going to the moon to create a long-term human presence on and around it, but also to prepare for ever more complex human missions to Mars. In short, everything we must be able to do here, we must first do here. So, what will an Artemis mission look like? Everything is designed and tested with our most important element in mind, the astronauts. This is their deep space, human-rated spacecraft called Orion, built in three parts. The crew module, where up to four astronauts will live and work throughout the flight. The service module, with life support systems for the crew and its own engine and fuel reserves. And a launch abort system, with engines capable of pulling the crew module to safety during launch should anything go wrong. To accomplish the task of launching our crew in heavy payloads, NASA is building the Space Launch System, comprising of a cargo hold, an exploration upper stage, a massive core stage, and two extended solid rocket boosters. Altogether, this is the world's most powerful rocket, and it exceeds the legendary Saturn V of the Apollo era in numerous ways. 
Sitting on the launch pad, the entire rocket, fully fueled, weighs just over 6 million pounds, 5.2 million of which is just the fuel. Once ignited, there was no stopping. All four RS-25 engines and the two solid rocket boosters come to life, thundering our crew upwards. Two minutes after ignition, the solid rocket boosters are spent and released. Eight minutes after launch, the core stage is depleted and separated. The upper stage fires briefly, placing Orion into a parking orbit around the Earth. Here, the crew reconfigure the spacecraft and check systems to confirm everything is ready for deep space travel. With a go from mission control, the crew reignite the exploration upper stage engines to leave Earth entirely. The exact timing of this maneuver is critical to reach a speed that can escape Earth's gravitational pull, but also put Orion on a course that will intercept the moon days later. Once this burn is complete, the upper stage of the SLS is jettisoned and the crew aboard Orion coast for several days toward all that awaits them at the moon. Approaching the moon, we see the fundamental differences between Artemis and Apollo. Instead of requiring Orion to serve as an expendable lunar command module or to carry a constrained lunar lander, the Artemis missions will take advantage of a different approach, pre-staging. Everything needed for lunar missions will be positioned in advance by commercial and international partners. This includes rovers, science experiments, and human rated systems on the surface. But it also includes a dedicated lunar station in orbit around the moon called Gateway. Here at this station, we can pre-stage a robust lunar lander and establish a strong communications relay. Designed with open standards, the Gateway can be expanded